Section 11 of The Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 6, Part 1, The Return Home. Two or three days after the surrender, the cavalry division was marched back to the foothills west of Elkany, and there went into camp, together with the artillery. It was a most beautiful spot beside a stream of clear water, but it was not healthy. In fact, no ground in the neighborhood was healthy. For the tropics the climate was not bad, and I have no question but that a man who was able to take good care of himself could live there all year round with comparative impunity. But the case was entirely different with an army, which was obliged to suffer great exposure and to live under conditions which almost ensured being attacked by the severe malarial fever of the country. My own men were already suffering badly from fever, and they got worse rather than better in the new camp. The same was true of the other regiments in the cavalry division. A curious feature was that the colored troops seemed to suffer as heavily as the white. From week to week there were slight relative changes, but on the average all the six cavalry regiments, the Rough Riders, the White Regulars, and the Colored Regulars, seemed to suffer about alike, and we were all very much weakened. About as much as the regular infantry, although naturally not as much as the volunteer infantry. Yet even under such circumstances, adventurous spirits managed to make their way out to us. In the fortnight following the last bombardment of the city, I enlisted no less than nine such recruits, six being from Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, and Bull, the former Harvard or who had been back to the States crippled after the first fight, actually got back to us as a stowaway on one of the transports, bound to share the luck of the regiment even if it met yellow fever. There were but twelve ambulances with the army, and these were quite inadequate for their work. But the conditions in the large field hospitals were so bad that as long as possible we kept all our sick men in the regimental hospital at the front. Dr. Church did splendid work, although he himself was suffering much more than half the time from fever. Several other men from the ranks did equally well, especially a young doctor from New York, Harry Thorpe, who had enlisted as a trooper but who was now made acting assistant surgeon. It was with the greatest difficulty that Church and Thorpe were able to get proper medicine for the sick, and it was almost the last day of our stay before we were able to get cots for them. Up to that time they lay on the ground. No food was issued suitable for them, or for the half-sick men who were not on the doctor's list. The two classes by this time included the bulk of the command— Occasionally, we got hold of a wagon or some Cuban carts, and at other times, I used my improvised pack train, the animals of which, however, were continually being taken away from us by our superiors, and went or sent back to the seacoast at Siboney or in Santiago itself to get rice, flour, cornmeal, oatmeal, condensed milk, potatoes, and canned vegetables. The rice I brought in Santiago, the best of the other stuff I got from the Red Cross through Mr. George Kennan and Miss Clara Barton, and Dr. Lesser, but some of it I got from our own transports. Colonel Weston, the Commissary General, as always, rendered us every service in his power. This additional and varied food was of the utmost service, not merely to the sick, but in preventing the well from becoming sick. Throughout the campaign, the Division Inspector General, Lieutenant Colonel Garlington, and Lieutenants West and Dickman, the Acting Division Quartermaster and Commissary, had done everything in their power to keep us supplied with food. But where there were so few mules and wagons, even such able and zealous officers could not do the impossible. We had the camp policed thoroughly, and I made the men build little bunks of poles to sleep on. By July 23rd, we had been ashore a month. We were able to get fresh meat, and from that time on we fared well. But the men were already sickening. The chief trouble was the malarial fever, which was recurrent. For a few days, the man would be very sick indeed. Then he would partially recover and be able to go back to work. But after a little time, he would be again struck down. Every officer other than myself, except one, was down with sickness at one time or another. Even Greenway and Goodrich succumbed to the fever and were knocked out for a few days. Very few of the men, indeed, retained their strength and energy and though the percentage actually on the sick list never got over 20, there were less than 50% who were fit for any kind of work. All the clothes were in rags. Even the officers had neither socks nor underwear. The lithe college athletes had lost their spring, 
the tall, gaunt hunters and cowpunchers lounged listlessly in their dog tents, which were steaming morasses during the torrential rains, and then ovens when the sun blazed down. But there were no complaints. Through some blunder, our march from the entrenchments to the camp on the foothills after the surrender was made during the heat of the day, and though it was only some five miles or thereabouts, very nearly half the men of the cavalry division dropped out. Captain Llewellyn had come back and led his troop on the march. He carried a pick and shovel for one of his sick men, and after we reached camp, walked back with a mule to get another trooper who had fallen out from heat exhaustion. The result was that the captain himself went down and became exceedingly sick. We at last succeeded in sending him to the States. I never thought he would live, but he did, and when I met him again at Montauk Point, he had practically entirely recovered. My orderly, Henry Barchar, was struck down, and though he ultimately recovered, he was a mere skeleton, having lost over 80 pounds. Yellow fever also broke out in the rear, chiefly among the Cubans. It never became epidemic, but it caused a perfect panic among some of our own doctors, and especially in the minds of one or two generals and of the home authorities. We found that whenever we sent a man to the rear, he was decreed to have yellow fever, whereas if we kept him at the front, it always turned out that he had malarial fever, and after a few days, he was back at work again. I doubt if there were ever more than a dozen genuine cases of yellow fever in the whole cavalry division, but the authorities at Washington, misled by the reports they received from one or two of their military and medical advisors at the front, became panic-struck, and under the influence of their fears, hesitated to bring the army home lest it might import yellow fever into the United States. Their panic was absolutely groundless, as shown by the fact that when brought home not a single case of yellow fever developed upon American soil. Our real foe was not yellow fever at all, but malarial fever, which was not infectious, but which was certain, if the troops were left throughout the summer in Cuba, to destroy them, either killing them outright or weakening them, so that they would have fallen victims to any disease that attacked them. However, for a time our prospects were gloomy, as the Washington authorities seemed determined that we should stay in Cuba. They unfortunately knew nothing of the country nor of the circumstances of the army, and the plans that were there from time to time formulated in the department, and even by an occasional general or surgeon at the front, for the management of the army would have been comic if they had not possessed such tragic possibilities. Thus, at one period, it was proposed that we should shift camp every two or three days, now, our transportation, as I have pointed out before, was utterly inadequate. In theory, under the regulations of the War Department, each regiment should have had at least 25 wagons. As a matter of fact, our regiment often had none, sometimes one, rarely two, and never three. Yet it was better off than any other in the cavalry division. In consequence, it was impossible to carry much of anything save what the men had on their backs, and half of the men were too weak to walk three miles with their packs. Whenever we shifted camp, the exertion among the half-sick caused our sick roll to double next morning, and it took at least three days, even when the shift was for but a short distance, before we were able to bring up the officer's luggage, the hospital spare food, the ammunition, and so forth. Meanwhile, the officers slept wherever they could, and those men who had not been able to carry their own bedding slept as the officers did. In the weak condition of the men, the labor of pitching camp was severe and told heavily upon them. In short, the scheme of continually shifting camp was impossible of fulfillment. It would merely have resulted in the early destruction of the army. Again, it was proposed that we should go up the mountains and make our camps there. The palm and the bamboo grew to the summits of the mountains, and the soil along their sides was deep and soft, while the rains were very heavy, much more so than immediately on the coast every mile or two inland bringing with it a great increase in the rainfall. We could, with much difficulty, have got our regiments up the mountains, but not half the men could have got up with their belongings, and once there, it would have been an impossibility to feed them. It was all that could be done with the limited number of wagons and mule trains on hand to feed the men in the existing camps, for the travel and rain gradually rendered each road in succession wholly impassable. To have gone up the mountains would have meant early starvation. The third plan of the department was even more objectionable than either of the others. There was some 25 miles in the interior what was called a high interior plateau, and at one period we were informed that we were to be marched thither. 
As a matter of fact, this so-called high plateau was the sugarcane country, where during the summer the rainfall was prodigious. It was a rich, deep soil covered with a rank tropic growth, the guinea grass being higher than the head of a man on horseback. It was a perfect hotbed of malaria, and there was no dry ground whatever in which to camp. To have sent the troops there would have been simple butchery. Under these circumstances, the alternative to leaving the country altogether was to stay where we were, with the hope that half the men would live through the cool season. We did everything possible to keep up the spirits of the men, but it was exceedingly difficult because there was nothing for them to do. They were weak and languid, and in the wet heat they had lost energy, so that it was not possible for them to indulge in sports or pastimes. There were exceptions, but the average man who went off to shoot guinea hens or tried some vigorous game always felt much the worse for his exertions. Once or twice I took some of my comrades with me and climbed up one or another of the surrounding mountains, but the result generally was that half of the party were down with some kind of sickness next day. It was impossible to take heavy exercise in the heat of the day. The evening usually saw a rainstorm which made the country a quagmire, and in the early morning the drenching dew and wet, slimy soil made walking but little pleasure. Chaplain Brown held service every Sunday under a low tree outside my tent, and we always had a congregation of a few score troopers, lying or sitting round, their strong, hard faces turned toward the preacher. I let a few of the men visit Santiago, but the long walk in and out was very tiring, and, moreover, wise restrictions had been put as to either officers or men coming in. In any event, there was very little to do in the quaint, dirty old Spanish city, though it was interesting to go in once or twice and wander through the narrow streets with their curious little shops and low houses of stained stucco with elaborately wrought iron trellises to the windows and curiously carved balconies, or to sit in the central plaza where the cathedral was and the clubs and the cafe venues and a low, bare, rambling building which was called the governor's palace. In this palace, Wood had now been established as military governor, and Luna and two or three of my other officers from the Mexican border who knew Spanish were sent in to do duty under him. A great many of my men knew Spanish, and some of the new Mexicans were of Spanish origin, although they behaved precisely like the other members of the regiment. We should probably have spent the summer in our sick camps, losing half the men and hopelessly shattering the health of the remainder if General Shafter had not summoned a council of officers hoping by united action of a more or less public character to wake up the Washington authorities to the actual conditions of things. As all the Spanish forces in the province of Santiago had surrendered, and as so-called immune regiments were coming to garrison the conquered territory, there was literally not one thing of any kind whatsoever for the army to do, and no purpose to serve by keeping it at Santiago. We did not suppose that peace was at hand, being ignorant of the negotiations. We were anxious to take part in the Puerto Rico campaign and would have been more than willing to suffer any amount of sickness if by so doing we could get into action. But if we were not to take part in the Puerto Rico campaign, then we knew it was absolutely indispensable to get our commands north immediately if they were to be in trim for the great campaign against Havana, which would surely be the main event of the winter if peace were not declared in advance. Our army included the great majority of the regulars and was therefore the flower of the American force. It was on every account imperative to keep it in good trim, and to keep it in Santiago meant its entirely purposeless destruction. As soon as the surrender was an accomplished fact, the taking away of the army to the north should have begun. Every officer, from the highest to the lowest, especially among the regulars, realized all of this, and about the last day of July, General Shafter called a conference in the palace of all the division and brigade commanders. By this time, owing to Woods having been made Governor General, I was in command of my brigade, so I went to the conference too, riding in with Generals Sumner and Wheeler, who were the other representatives of the cavalry division. Besides the line officers, all the chief medical officers were present at the conference. The telegrams from the secretary stating the position of himself and the Surgeon General were read, and then almost every line and medical officer present expressed his views in turn. They were almost all regulars and had been brought up to lifelong habits of obedience without protest. They were ready to obey still, but they felt, quite rightly, 
that it was their duty to protest rather than to see the flower of the United States forces destroyed as the culminating act of a campaign in which the blunders that had been committed had been retrieved only by the valor and splendid soldierly qualities of the officers and enlisted men of the infantry and dismounted cavalry. There was not a dissenting voice where there could not be. There was not but one side to the question. To talk of continually shifting camp or of moving up the mountains or of moving into the interior was idle for not one of the plans could be carried out with our utterly insufficient transportation, and at that season and in that climate they would merely have resulted in aggravating the sickliness of the soldiers. It was deemed best to make some record of our opinion in the shape of a letter or report, which would show that to keep the army in Santiago meant its absolute and objectless ruin, and that it should at once be recalled. At first there was naturally some hesitation on the part of the regular officers to take the initiative, for their entire future career might be sacrificed. So I wrote a letter to General Shafter, reading over a rough draft to the various generals and adopting their corrections. Before I had finished making these corrections, it was determined that we should send a circular letter on behalf of all of us to General Shafter, and when I returned from presenting him mine, I found this circular letter already prepared, and we all of us signed it. Both letters were made public. The result was immediate. Within three days, the army was ordered to be ready to sail for home. As soon as it was known that we were to sail for home, the spirits of the men changed for the better. In my regiment, the officers began to plan methods of drilling the men on horseback so as to fit them for use against the Spanish cavalry if we should go against Havana in December. We had, all of us, eyed the captured Spanish cavalry with particular interest. The men were small, and the horses, though well-trained and well-built, were diminutive ponies very much smaller than cow ponies. We were certain that if we ever got a chance to try shock tactics against them, they would go down like ninepins, provided only that our men could be trained to charge in any kind of line, and we made up our minds to devote our time to this. Dismounted work with the rifle we already felt thoroughly competent to perform. My time was still much occupied with looking after the health of my brigade, but the fact that we were going home, where I knew that their health would improve, lightened my mind, and I was able thoroughly to enjoy the beauty of the country and even of the storms, which hitherto I had regarded purely as enemies. The surroundings of the city of Santiago are very grand. The circling mountains rise sheer and high. The plains are threaded by rapid winding brooks and are dotted here and there with quaint villages, curiously picturesque from their combining traces of an outworn old-world civilization with new and raw barbarism. The tall, graceful, feathery bamboos rise by the water's edge and elsewhere, even on the mountain crest, where the soil is wet and rank enough, and the splendid royal palms and coconut palms tower high above the matted green jungle. Generally, the thunderstorms came in the afternoon, but once I saw one at sunrise, driving down the high mountain valleys toward us. It was a very beautiful and almost terrible sight, for the sun rose behind a storm and shone through the gusty rifts, lighting the mountain crest here and there while the plain below lay shrouded in the lingering night. The angry, level rays edged the dark clouds with crimson and turned the downpour into sheets of golden rain. In the valleys, the glimmering mists were tinted every wild hue, and the remotest heavens were lit with flaming glory. One day, General Lawton, General Wood, and I, with Ferguson and poor Tiffany, went down the bay to visit Morro Castle. The shores were beautiful especially where there were groves of palms and of the scarlet flower tree, and the castle itself on a jutting headland overlooking the sea and guarding the deep, narrow entrance to the bay, showed just what it was, the splendid relic of a vanished power in a vanished age. We wandered all through it, among the castellated battlements and in the dungeons where we found hideous, rusty implements of torture, and looked at the guns, some modern and some very old. It had been little hurt by the bombardment of the ships, Afterward, I had a swim, not trusting much to the shark stories. We passed by the sunken hulks of the Merrimack and the Rena Mercedes, lying just outside the main channel. Our own people had tried to sink the first, and the Spaniards had tried to sink the second, so as to block the entrance. Neither attempt was successful. On August 6, we were ordered to embark, and next morning we sailed on the transport Miami. General Wheeler was with us in a squadron of the 3rd Cavalry under Major Jackson. The general put the policing and management of the ship into my hands, and I had great aid from Captain McCormick, who had been acting with me as adjutant general of the brigade. 
I had profited by my experience coming down, and as Dr. Church knew his work well, although he was very sick, we kept the ship in such good sanitary condition that we were one of the very few organizations allowed to land at Montauk immediately upon our arrival. Soon after leaving the port, the captain of the ship notified me that his stokers and engineers were insubordinate and drunken, due, he thought, to liquor which my men had given them. I at once started a search of the ship, explaining to the men that they could not keep the liquor, that if they surrendered whatever they had to me, I should return it to them when we went ashore, and that meanwhile I would allow the sick to drink when they really needed it, but that if they did not give the liquor to me of their own accord, I would throw it overboard. About seventy flasks and bottles were handed to me, and I found and threw overboard about twenty. This at once put a stop to all drunkenness. The stokers and engineers were sullen and half-mutinous, so I sent a detail of my men down to watch them and see that they did their work under the orders of the chief engineer, and we reduced them to obedience in short order. I could easily have drawn from the regiment sufficient skilled men to fill every position in the entire ship's crew from captain to stoker. We were very much crowded on board the ship, but rather better off than on the Yucatan, so far as the men were concerned, which was the important point. All the officers, except General Wheeler, slept in a kind of improvised shed, not unlike a chicken coop with bunks, on the aftermost part of the upper deck. The water was bad, some of it very bad. There was no ice, the canned beef proved practically uneatable, as we knew would be the case. There were not enough vegetables, we did not have enough disinfectants, and there was no provision whatever for a hospital or for isolating the sick. We simply put them on one portion of one deck. If, as so many of the high authorities had insisted, there had really been a yellow fever epidemic, and if it had broken out on shipboard, the condition would have been frightful. But there was no yellow fever epidemic. Three of our men had been kept behind as suspects, all three suffering simply from malarial fever. One of them, Lutz, a particularly good soldier, died. Another, who was simply a malingerer and had nothing the matter with him whatever, of course recovered. The third was Tiffany, who, I believe, would have lived had we been allowed to take him with us, but who was sent home later and died soon after landing. I was very anxious to keep the men amused, and as the quarters were so crowded that it was out of the question for them to have any physical exercise, I did not interfere with their playing games of chance so long as no disorder followed. On shore this was not allowed. But in the particular emergency which we were meeting, the loss of a month's salary was as nothing compared to keeping the men thoroughly interested and diverted. By care and diligence, we succeeded in preventing any serious sickness. One man died, however. He had been suffering from dysentery ever since we landed, owing purely to his own fault, for on the very first night ashore he obtained a lot of fiery liquor from some of the Cubans, got very drunk, and had to march next day through the hot sun before he was entirely sober. He never recovered and was useless from that time on. On board ship, he died, and we gave him a sea burial. Wrapped in a hammock, he was placed opposite a port and the American flag thrown over him. The engine was stilled, and the great ship rocked on the waves, unshaken by the screw, while the war-worn troopers clustered around with bare heads to listen to Chaplain Brown read the funeral service and to the band of the 3rd Cavalry as it played the funeral dirge. Then the port was knocked free, the flag withdrawn, and the shotted hammock plunged heavily over the side, rushing down through the dark water to lie, till the judgment day, in the ooze that holds timbers of so many gallant ships and the bones of so many fearless adventurers. We were favored by good weather during our nine days' voyage, and much of the time, when there was little to do, we simply sat together and talked, each man contributing from the fund of his own experiences. Voyages around Cape Horn, yacht races for the America's Cup, experiences on football teams which are famous in the annals of college sport, more serious feats of desperate prowess in Indian fighting and in breaking up gangs of white outlaws, adventures in hunting big game, in breaking wild horses, in tending great herds of cattle, and in wandering winter and summer among the mountains and across the lonely plains. The men who told the tales could draw upon countless memories such as these of the things they had done and the things they had seen others do. Sometimes General Wheeler joined us and told us about the Great War, compared with which ours was such a small war, far-reaching in their importance, though, its effects were destined to be. When we had become convinced that we would escape an epidemic of sickness, the homeward voyage became very pleasant. End of Chapter 6, Part 1 
Section 12 of the Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 6, Part 2. On the eve of leaving Santiago, I had received from Mr. Laffin of the Sun a cable with the single word, Peace, and we speculated much on this, as the clumsy transport steamed slowly northward across the trade wind and then into the Gulf Stream. At last we sighted the low, sandy bluffs of the Long Island coast, and late on the afternoon of the 14th we steamed through the still waters of the Sound and cast anchor off Montauk. A gunboat of the Mosquito Fleet came out to greet us and to inform us that peace negotiations had begun. Next morning we were marched on shore. Many of my men were very sick indeed. Of the three or four who had been closest to me among the enlisted men, Color Sergeant Wright was the only one in good health. Henry Barchar was a wreck, literally at death's door. I was myself in first-class health, all the better for having lost twenty pounds. Faithful Marshal, my colored body servant, was so sick as to be nearly helpless. Bob Wren nearly died. He had joined us very late, and we could not get him a crag carbine. So I had given him my Winchester, which carried the government cartridge, and when he was mustered out he carried it home in triumph to the envy of his fellows, who themselves had to surrender their beloved rifles. For the first few days there was great confusion, and some want even after we got to Montauk. The men in hospitals suffered from the lack of almost everything, even cots. But after these few days we were very well cared for and had abundance of all we needed, except that on several occasions there was a shortage of food for the horses, which I should have regarded as even more serious than a shortage for the men, had it not been that we were about to be disbanded. The men lived high, with milk, eggs, oranges, and any amount of tobacco, the lack of which, during portions of the Cuban campaign, had been felt as seriously as any lack of food. One of the distressing features of the malarial fever which had been ravaging the troops was that it was recurrent and persistent. Some of my men died after reaching home, and many were very sick. We owed much to the kindness not only of the New York hospitals and the Red Cross and kindred societies, but of individuals, notably Mr. Bayard Cutting and Mrs. Armitage, who took many of our men to their beautiful Long Island homes. On the whole, however, the month we spent at Montauk before we disbanded was very pleasant. It was good to meet the rest of the regiment. They all felt dreadfully at not having been in Cuba. It was a sore trial to men who had given up much to go to the war, and who rebelled at nothing in the way of hardship or suffering, but who did bitterly feel the fact that their sacrifices seemed to have been useless. Of course, those who stayed had done their duty precisely as did those who went, for the question of glory was not to be considered in comparison to the faithful performance of whatever was ordered, and no distinction of any kind was allowed in the regiment between those whose good fortune it had been to go and those whose harder fate it had been to remain. Nevertheless, the latter could not be entirely comforted. The regiment had three mascots, the two most characteristic, a young mountain lion, brought by the Arizona troops, and a war eagle, brought by the New Mexicans, we had been forced to leave behind in Tampa. The third, a rather disreputable but exceedingly knowingly little dog named Cuba, had accompanied us through all the vicissitudes of the campaign. The mountain lion, Josephine, possessed an infernal temper, whereas both Cuba and the eagle, which had been named in my honor, were extremely good-humored. Josephine was kept tied up. She sometimes escaped. One cool night in early September, she wandered off and, entering the tent of a third cavalryman, got into bed with him, whereupon he fled into darkness with yells, much more unnerved than he would have been by the arrival of any number of Spaniards. The eagle was let loose, and not only walked at will up and down the company streets, but also at times flew wherever he wished. He was a young bird, having been taken out of his nest when a fledgling. Josephine hated him and was always trying to make a meal of him especially when we endeavored to take their photographs together. The eagle, though good-natured, was an entirely competent individual and ready at any moment to beat Josephine off. Cuba was also oppressed at times by Josephine and was, of course, no match for her, but was frequently able to overawe by simple decision of character. In addition to the animal mascots, we had two or three small boys who had also been adopted by the regiment. One from Tennessee was named Dabney Royster, when we embarked at Tampa, he smuggled himself on board the transport with a twenty-two caliber rifle and three boxes of cartridges, and wept bitterly when sent ashore. 
The squadron, which remained behind, adopted him, got him a little Rough Rider's uniform, and made him practically one of the regiment. The men who had remained at Tampa, like ourselves, had suffered much from fever, and the horses were in bad shape. So many of the men were sick that none of the regiments began the drill for some time after reaching Montauk. There was a great deal of paperwork to be done, but as I still had charge of the brigade, only a little of it fell on my shoulders. Of this I was sincerely glad, for I knew as little of the paperwork as my men had originally known of drill. We had all of us learn how to fight and march, but the exact limits of our rights and duties in other respects were not very clearly defined in our minds. And, as for myself, as I had not had the time to learn exactly what they were, I had assumed a large authority in giving rewards and punishments. In particular, I had looked on court-martials much as Peter Bell looked on primroses. They were court-martials and nothing more, whether resting on the authority of a lieutenant colonel or of a major general. The mustering-out officer, a thorough soldier, found to his horror that I had used the widest discretion, both in imposing heavy sentences, which I had no power to impose on men who shirked their duties, and where men atoned for misconduct by marked gallantry, in blandly remitting sentences approved by my chief of division. However, I had done substantial, even though somewhat rude and irregular justice, and no harm could result, as we were just about to be mustered out. My chief duties were to see that the camps of the three regiments were thoroughly policed and kept in first-class sanitary condition. This took up some time, of course, and there were other matters in connection with the mustering out which had to be attended to, but I could always get two or three hours a day free from work. Then I would summon a number of the officers, Kane, Greenway, Goodrich, Church, Ferguson, McElhenney, France, Boward, and others, and we would gallop down to the beach and bathe in the surf or else go for long rides over the beautiful rolling plains, thickly studded with pools, which were white with water lilies. Sometimes I went off alone with my orderly, young Gordon Johnson, one of the best men in the regiment. He was a nephew of the governor of Alabama, and went at Princeton had played on the 11. We had plenty of horses, and these rides were most enjoyable. Galloping over the open, rolling country through the cool fall evenings made us feel as if we were out on the great western plains, and might at any moment start deer from the brush, or see antelope stand and gaze, far away, or rouse a band of mighty elk and hear their horns clatter as they fled. An old friend, Baron von Sternberg, of the German embassy, spent a week in camp with me. He had served, when only seventeen, in the Franco-Prussian War as a hussar, and was a noted sharpshooter, being the Little Baron, who is the hero of Archibald Forbes' true story of The Pig Dog, he and I had for years talked over possibilities of just such a regiment as one I was commanding, and he was greatly interested in it. Indeed, I had vainly sought permission from the German ambassador to take him with the regiment to Santiago. One Sunday, before the regiment disbanded, I supplemented Chaplain Brown's address to the men by a short sermon of a rather hortatory character. I told them how proud I was of them, but warned them not to think that they could now go back and rest on their laurels bidding them remember that though for ten days or so the world would be willing to treat them as heroes, yet after time they would find that they had to get down to hard work just like everyone else, unless they were willing to be regarded as worthless do-nothings. They took the sermon in good part, and I hope that some of them profited by it. At any rate, they repay me by a very much more tangible expression of affection. One afternoon, to my genuine surprise, I was asked out of my tent by Lieutenant Colonel Brody, the gallant old boy had rejoined us, and found the whole regiment formed in a hollow square with the officers and color sergeant in the middle. When I went in, one of the troopers came forward and on behalf of the regiment presented me with Remington's fine bronze, the Bronco Buster. There could have been no more appropriate gift from such a regiment, and I was not only pleased with it, but very deeply touched with the feeling which made them join in giving it. Afterward, they all filed past and I shook the hands of each to say goodbye. Most of them looked upon the bronze with the critical eyes of professionals. I doubt if there was any regiment in the world which contained so large a number of men able to ride the wildest and most dangerous horses. One day, while at Montauk Point, some of the troopers of the 3rd Cavalry were getting ready for mounted drill when one of their horses escaped, having thrown his rider. This attracted the attention of some of our men, and they strolled around to see the trooper remount. He was instantly thrown again. The horse, a huge vicious sorrel, being one of the worst buckers I ever saw, 
and none of his comrades were willing to ride the animal. Our men, of course, jeered and mocked at them, and in response were dared to ride the horse themselves. The challenge was instantly accepted, the only question being as to which of a dozen noted bronco-busters who were in the ranks should undertake the task. They finally settled on a man named Darnell. It was agreed that the experiment should take place next day when the horse would be fresh, and accordingly next day the majority of both regiments turned out on a big open flat in front of my tent, brigade headquarters. The result was that, after as fine a bit of rough riding as one would care to see, in which one scarcely knew whether most to wonder at the extraordinary viciousness and agile strength of the horse, or at the horsemanship and courage of the rider, Darnell came off victorious, his seat never having been shaken. After this, almost every day we had exhibitions of bronco-busting, in which all the crack riders of the regiment vied with one another, riding not only all of our bad horses, but any horse which was deemed bad in any of the other regiments. Darnell, McGinty, Wood, Smokey Moore, and a score of others took part in these exhibitions, which included not merely feats in mastering vicious horses, but also feats of broken horses which the riders had trained to lie down at command and upon which they could mount while at full speed. Toward the end of the time, we also had mounted drill on two or three occasions, and when the president visited the camp, we turned out mounted to receive him, as did the rest of the cavalry. The last night before we were mustered out was spent in noisy but entirely harmless hilarity, which I ignored. Every form of celebration took place in the ranks. A former populist candidate for attorney general in Colorado delivered a fervent oration in favor of free silver. A number of the college boys sang, but most of the men gave vent to their feelings by improvised dances. In these, the Indians took the lead, purebloods and half-breeds alike the cowboys and miners cheerfully joining in and forming part of the howling, grunting rings that went bounding around the great fires they had kindled. Next morning, Sergeant Wright took down the colors and Sergeant Gutelias the standard for the last time. The horses, the rifles, and the rest of the regimental property had been turned in. Officers and men shook hands and said goodbye to one another, and then they scattered to their homes in the north and the south, the few going back to the great cities of the east, the many turning again toward the plains, the mountains, and the deserts of the west and the strange southwest. This was on September 15th, the day which marked the close of the four months' life of a regiment of as gallant fighters as ever wore the United States uniform. The regiment was a wholly exceptional volunteer organization, and its career cannot be taken as in any way a justification for the belief that the average volunteer regiment approaches the average regular regiment in point of efficiency until it has had many months of active service. In the first place, though the regular regiments may differ markedly among themselves, yet the range of variation among them is nothing like so wide as that among volunteer regiments, where at first there is no common standard at all, the very best being, perhaps up to the level of the regulars, as has recently been shown at Manila, while the very worst are no better than mobs, and the great bulk come in between. The average regular regiment is superior to the average volunteer regiment in the physique of the enlisted men, who have been very carefully selected, who have been trained to life in the open, and who know how to cook and take care of themselves generally. Note, for sound common sense about the volunteers, see Parker's excellent little book, The Gatlings as Santiago. Now, in all these respects, and in others like them, the Rough Riders were the equals of the regulars. They were hardy, self-reliant, accustomed to shift for themselves in the open under very adverse circumstances. The two all-important qualifications for a cavalryman are riding and shooting, the modern cavalryman being so often used dismounted as an infantryman. The average recruit requires a couple of years before he becomes proficient in horsemanship and markmanship. But my men were already good shots and first-class riders when they came into the regiment. The difference, as regards officers and non-commissioned officers, between regulars and volunteers is usually very great. But in my regiment, keeping in view the material we had to handle, it was easy to develop non-commissioned officers out of men who had been roundup foremen, ranch foremen, mining bosses, and the like. These men were intelligent and resolute. They knew they had a great deal to learn, and they set to work to learn it. While they were already accustomed to managing considerable interest, to obeying orders, and to taking care of others as well as themselves. As for the officers, the great point in our favor was the anxiety they showed to learn from those among their number who, like Capron, had already served in the regular army, 
and the fact that we had chosen a regular army man as colonel. If a volunteer organization consists of good material and is eager to learn, it can readily do so if it has one or two first-class regular officers to teach it. Moreover, most of our captains and lieutenants were men who had seen much of wild life, who were accustomed to handling and commanding other men, and who had usually already been under fire as sheriffs, marshals, and the like. As for the second-in-command, myself, I had served three years as captain in the National Guard. I had been deputy sheriff in the cow country, where the position was not a sinecure. I was accustomed to big game hunting and to work on a cow ranch, so that I was thoroughly familiar with the use both of horse and rifle, and knew how to handle cowboys, hunters, and miners. Finally, I had studied much in the literature of war, and especially the literature of the great modern wars, like our own Civil War, the Franco-German War, the Turco-Russian War, and I was especially familiar with the deeds, the successes, and failures alike of the frontier horse riflemen who had fought at Kings Mountain and the Toms and on the Mexican border. Finally, and most important of all, officers and men alike were eager for fighting and resolute to do well and behave properly to encounter hardship and privation and the irksome monotony of camp routine without grumbling or complaining. They had counted the cost before they went in, and were delighted to pay the penalties inevitably attendant upon the career of a fighting regiment. And from the moment when the regiment began to gather, the higher officers kept instilling into those under them the spirit of eagerness for action and of stern determination to grasp at death rather than forfeit honor. The self-reliant spirit of the men was well shown after they left the regiment. Of course, there were a few weaklings among them, and there were others entirely brave and normally self-sufficient, who, from wounds or fevers, were so reduced that they had to apply for aid, or at least who deserved aid, even though they often could only be persuaded with the greatest difficulty to accept it. The widows and orphans had to be taken care of. There were a few light-hearted individuals who were entirely ready to fight in time of war, but in time of peace felt that somebody ought to take care of them. And there were others who, never having seen any aggregation of buildings larger than an ordinary cow town, fell a victim to the fascinations of New York. But, as a whole, they scattered out to their homes on the disbandment of the regiment, gaunter than when they had enlisted, sometimes weakened by fever or wounds, but just as full as ever a sullen, sturdy capacity for self-help, scorning to ask for aid, save what was entirely legitimate in the way of one comrade giving help to another. A number of the examining surgeons at the muster-out spoke to me with admiration of the contrast offered by our regiment to so many others in the fact that our men always belittled their own bodily injuries and sufferings, so that, whereas the surgeons ordinarily had to be on the lookout, lest a man who was not really disabled should claim to be so, in our case they had to adopt exactly the opposite attitude and guard the future interests of the men, by insisting upon putting upon their certificates of discharge whatever disease they had contracted or wound they had received in the line of duty. Major J. H. Caliph who had more than any other man to do with seeing to the proper discharge papers of our men, and who took a most generous interest in them, wrote me as follows. I also wish to bring to your notice the fortitude displayed by the men of your regiment, who have come before me to be mustered out of service, in making their personal declarations as to their physical conditions. Men who bore on their faces and in their forms the traces of long days of illness, indicating wrecked constitutions, declared that nothing was the matter with them, at the same time disclaiming any intention of applying for a pension. It was exceptionally heroic. When we were mustered out, many of the men had lost their jobs and were too weak to go to work at once, while there were helpless dependents of the dead to care for. Certain of my friends, August Belmont, Stanley and Richard Mortimer, Major Austin Wadsworth, himself fresh from Manila campaign, Belmont Tiffany, and others, gave me sums of money to be used for helping these men. In some instances, by the exercise of a good deal of tact and by treating the gift as a memorial of poor young Lieutenant Tiffany, we got the men to accept something. And, of course, there were a number who, quite rightly, made no difficulty about accepting. But most of the men would accept no help whatever. In the first chapter, I spoke of a lady, a teacher in an academy in the Indian Territory, three or four of whose pupils had come into my regiment and who had sent with them a letter of introduction to me, when the regiment disbanded, I wrote to her to ask if she could not use a little money among the rough riders, white, Indian, and half-breed, that she might personally know. I did not hear from her for some time, and then she wrote as follows. 
Muskegee, Indiana, Territory, December 19, 1898. My dear Colonel Roosevelt, I did not at once reply to your letter of September 23rd because I waited for a time to see if there should be need among any of our rough riders of the money you so kindly offered. Some of the boys are poor, and in one or two cases they seem to me really needy, but they all said no. More than once I saw the tears come to their eyes. I thought of your care for them, as I told them of your letter. Did you hear any echoes of our Indian war whoops over your election? They were pretty loud. I was particularly exultant because my father was a New Yorker and I was educated in New York even if I was born here. So far as I can learn, the boys are taking up the dropped threads of their lives as though they had never been away. Our two Rough Rider students, Marr and Gilmore, are doing well in their college work. I am sorry to tell you of the death of one of your most devoted troopers, Bert Halderman, who was here serving on the grand jury. He was stricken with meningitis in the jury room and died after three days of delirium. His father, who was twice wounded, four times taken prisoner, and fought in thirty-two battles of the Civil War, now old and feeble, survives him, and it was indeed pathetic to see his grief. Bert's mother, who was a Cherokee, was raised in my grandfather's family. The words of commendation which you wrote upon Bert's discharge are the greatest comfort to his friends. They wanted you to know of his death because he loved you so. I am planning to entertain all the rough riders in this vicinity some evening during my holiday vacation. I mean to have no other guests but only give them an opportunity for reminiscences. I regret that Bert's death makes one less. I had hoped to have them sooner, but our struggling young college salaries are necessarily small and duties arduous. I make a home for my widowed mother and an adopted Indian daughter, who is in school, and as I do the cooking for a family of five, I have found it impossible to do many things I would like to do. Pardon me for burdening you with these details, but I suppose I am like your boys who say, the colonel was always as ready to listen to a private as to a major general. Wishing you and yours the very best gifts the season can bring, I am, very truly yours, Alice M. Robertson. Is it any wonder that I love my regiment? End of chapter 6, part 2 Section 13 of The Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt Appendix A. Muster Out Roll Owing to the circumstances of the regiment's service, the paperwork was very difficult to perform. This muster out roll is very defective in certain points, notably in the enumeration of the wounded who have been able to return to duty. Some of the dead are also undoubtedly passed over. Thus, I have put in Ray Smith, Sanders, and Tiffany as dead, correcting the rolls. But there are doubtless a number of similar corrections which should be made, but have not been, as the regiment is now scattered far and wide. I have also corrected the record for the wounded men in one or two places, where I happen to remember it. But there are a number of the wounded, especially the slightly wounded, who are not down at all. Field Staff and Band Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, Troop A. Captain Frank France, Troop B. Captain James H. McClintock, Troop C. Captain Joseph L. B. Alexander, Troop D. Captain R. B. Huston, Troop E. Captain Frederick Mueller, Troop F. Captain Maximilian Luna, Troop G. Captain William H. H. Llewellyn, Troop H. Captain George Curry, Troop I. Captain Schuyler A. McGinnis, Troop K. Captain Woodbury Kane, Troop L. Captain Richard C. Day, Troop M. Captain Robert H. Bruce. As said above, this is not a complete list of the wounded, or even of the dead, among the troopers. Moreover, a number of officers and men died from fever soon after the regiment was mustered out. Twenty-eight field and line officers landed in Cuba on June 22nd. Ten of them were killed or wounded during the nine days following. Of the five regiments of regular cavalry in the division, one, the 10th, lost 11 officers. None of the others lost more than six. The loss of the Rough Riders in enlisted men was heavier than that of any other regiment in the cavalry division. Of the nine infantry regiments in Kent's division, one, the 6th, lost 11 officers. None of the others as many as we did. None of the nine suffered as heavy a loss in enlisted men as they were not engaged at Las Guasimas. 
no other regiment in the Spanish-American War suffered as heavy a loss as the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry. End of Appendix A Section 14 of the Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt Appendix B Colonel Roosevelt's Report to the Secretary of War of September 10th Before it was sent, this letter was read to and approved by every officer of the regiment who had served through the Santiago Campaign. Copy Camp Wickoff, September 10, 1898 To the Secretary of War Sir, in answer to the circular issued by command of Major General Shafter under date of September 8, 1898, containing a request for information by the Adjutant General of September 7th, I have the honor to report as follows. I am a little in doubt whether the fact that on certain occasions my regiment suffered for food, etc., should be put down to an actual shortage of supplies or to general defects in the system of administration. Thus, when the regiment arrived in Tampa after a four days journey by cars from its camp at San Antonio, it received no food whatsoever for 24 hours, and as the travel rations had been completely exhausted, food for several of the troops was purchased by their officers, who, of course, have not been reimbursed by the government. In the same way, we were short one or two meals at the time of embarking at Port Tampa on the transport, but this, I think, was due not to a failure in the quantity of supplies, but to the lack of system in embarkation. As with the other regiments, no information was given in advance what transports we should take, or how we should proceed to get aboard, nor did anyone exercise any supervision over the embarkation. Each regimental commander, so far as I know, was left to find out as best he could, after he was down at the dock, what transport had not been taken, and then to get his regiment aboard it, if he was able, before some other regiment got it. Our regiment was told to go to a certain switch and take a train for Port Tampa at 12 o'clock midnight. The train never came. After three hours of waiting, we were sent to another switch and finally at six o'clock in the morning got possession of some coal cars and came down in them. When we reached the quay where the embarkation was proceeding, everything was in utter confusion. The quay was piled with stores and swarming with thousands of men of different regiments, besides onlookers, etc. The commanding general, when we at last found him, told Colonel Wood and myself that he did not know what ship we were to embark on and that we must find Colonel Humphrey, the quartermaster general. Colonel Humphrey was not in his office, and nobody knew where he was. The commanders of the different regiments were busy trying to find him, while their troops waited in the trains so as to discover the ships to which they were allotted, some of these ships being at the dock and some in midstream. After a couple of hours' search, Colonel Wood found Colonel Humphrey and was allotted a ship. Immediately afterward, I found that it had already been allotted to two other regiments. It was then coming to the dock. Colonel Wood boarded it in midstream to keep possession, while I double-quicked the men down from the cars and got there just ahead of the other two regiments. One of these regiments, I was afterward informed, spent the next 36 hours in cars in consequence. We suffered nothing beyond the loss of a couple of meals, which, it seems to me, can hardly be put down to any failure in the quantity of supplies furnished to the troops. We were two weeks on the troop ship Yucatan, and as we were given twelve days' travel rations, we of course fell short toward the end of the trip, but eked things out with some of our field rations and troop stuff. The quality of the travel rations given us was good, except in the important item of meat. The canned roast beef is worse than a failure as part of the rations, for in effect it amounts to reducing the rations by just so much, as a great majority of the men find it uneatable. It was coarse, stringy, tasteless, and very disagreeable in appearance, and so unpalatable that the effort to eat it made some of the men sick. Most of the men preferred to be hungry rather than to eat it. If cooked in a stew with plenty of onions and potatoes, i.e., if only one ingredient in a dish with other more savory ingredients, it could be eaten, especially if well salted and peppered. But, as usual, what I regard as a great mistake, no salt was issued with the travel rations, and, of course, no potatoes and onions. There was no cooking facilities on the transport. When the men obtained any, it was by bribing the cook. Toward the last, when they began to draw on the field rations, they had to eat the bacon raw. On the return trip, the same difficulty in rations obtained, i.e., the rations were short because the men could not eat the canned roast beef and had no salt. We purchased of the ship's supplies some flour and pork, 
and a little rice for the men, so as to relieve the shortage as much as possible, and individual sick men were helped from private sources by officers who themselves ate what they had purchased in Santiago. As nine-tenths of the men were more or less sick, the unattractiveness of the travel rations was doubly unfortunate. It would have been an excellent thing for their health if we could have had onions and potatoes and means for cooking them. Moreover, the water was very bad, and sometimes a cask was struck that was positively undrinkable. The lack of ice for the weak and sickly men was very much felt. Fortunately, there was no epidemic, for there was not a place on the ship where patients could have been isolated. During the month following the landing of the army in Cuba, the food supplies were generally short in quantity, and in quality were never such as were best suited to men undergoing severe hardships and great exposure in an unhealthy tropical climate. The rations were, I understand, the same as those used in the Klondike. In this connection, I call special attention to the report of Captain Brown made by my orders when I was brigade commander, and herewith appended. I also call attention to the report of my own quartermaster. Usually, we received full rations of bacon and hardtack. The hardtack, however, was often moldy, so that parts of cases and even whole cases could not be used. The bacon was usually good, but bacon and hardtack make poor food for men toiling and fighting in trenches under the midsummer sun of the tropics. The ration of coffee was often short, and that of sugar generally so. We rarely got any vegetables. Under these circumstances, the men lost strength steadily, and as the fever speedily attacked them, they suffered from being reduced to a bacon and hardtack diet. So much did the shortage of proper food tell upon their health that again and again officers were compelled to draw upon their private purses or upon the Red Cross Society to make good the deficiency of the government supply. Again and again, we sent down improvised pack trains composed of officers' horses of captured Spanish cavalry ponies or of mules which had been shot or abandoned but were cured by our men. These expeditions, sometimes under the chaplain, sometimes under the quartermaster, sometimes under myself, and occasionally under a trooper, would go to the seacoast or to the Red Cross headquarters, or, after the surrender, into the city of Santiago, to get food both for the well and the sick. The Red Cross Society rendered invaluable aid. For example, on one of these expeditions, I personally bought up 600 pounds of beans. On another occasion, I personally bought up 500 pounds of rice, 800 pounds of cornmeal, 200 pounds of sugar, 100 pounds of tea, 100 pounds of oatmeal, 5 barrels of potatoes, and 2 of onions, with cases of canned soup and condensed milk for the sick in hospitals. Every scrap of the food thus brought up was eaten with avidity by the soldiers and put new heart and strength into them. It was only our constant care of the men in this way that enabled us to keep them in any trim at all. As for the sick in the hospital, unless we were able from outside sources to get them such simple delicacies as rice and condensed milk, they usually had the alternative of eating salt, pork, and hardtack or going without. After each fight, we got a good deal of food from the Spanish camps in the way of beans, peas, and rice, together with green coffee, all of which the men used and relished greatly. In some respects, the Spanish rations were preferable to ours, notably in the use of rice. After we had been ashore a month, the supplies began to come in in abundance, and we then fared very well. Up to that time, the men were underfed during the very weeks when the heaviest drain was being made upon their vitality, and the deficiency was only partially supplied through the aid of the Red Cross and out of the officers' pockets and the pockets of various New York friends who sent us money. Before, during, and immediately after the fights of June 24th and July 1st, we were very short of even the bacon and hardtack. About July 14th, when the heavy rains interrupted communication, we were threatened with famine, as we were informed that there was not a day's supply of provisions in advance nearer than the seacoast, and another 24 hours' rain would have resulted in a complete breakdown of communications, so that for several days we should have been reduced to a diet of mule meat and mangoes. At this time, in anticipation of such a contingency, by foraging and hoarding, we got a little ahead, so that when our supplies were cut down for a day or two, we did not suffer much, and we were even able to furnish a little aid to the less fortunate 1st Illinois Regiment, which was camped next to us. Members of the Illinois Regiment were offering our men one dollar apiece for hard tax. I wish to bear testimony to the energy and capacity of Colonel Weston 
the commissary general with the expedition. If it had not been for his active aid, we should have fared worse than we did. All that he could do for us, he most cheerfully did. As regards the clothing, I have to say, as to the first issue, the blue shirts were excellent of their kind, but altogether too hot for Cuba. They are just what I used to wear in Montana. The leggings were good, the shoes were very good, the undershirts not very good, and the drawers bad, being of heavy, thick canton flannel, difficult to wash, and entirely unfit for a tropical climate. The trousers were poor, wearing badly. We did not get any other clothing until we were just about to leave Cuba, by which time most of the men were in tatters, some being actually barefooted, while others were in rags, or dressed partly in clothes captured from the Spaniards, who were much more suitably clothed for the climate and place than we were. The ponchos were poor, being inferior to the Spanish raincoats which we captured. As to the medical matters, I invite your attention not only to the report of Dr. Church accompanying this letter, but to the letters of Captain Llewellyn, Captain Day, and Lieutenant McElhenney. I could readily produce a hundred letters on the lines of the last three. In actual medical supplies, we have plenty of quinine and cathartics. We were apt to be short on other medicines, and we had nothing whatever in the way of proper nourishing food for our sick and wounded men during most of the time, except what we were able to get from the Red Cross or purchase with our own money. We had no hospital tent at all until I was able to get a couple of tarpaulins. During much of the time, my own fly was used for the purpose. We had no cots until by individual effort we obtained a few, only three or four days before we left Cuba. During most of the time, the sick men lay on the muddy ground in blankets, if they had any. If not, they lay without them until some of the well men cut their own blankets in half. Our regimental surgeon very soon left us, and Dr. Church, who was repeatedly taken down with the fever, was left alone, save as he was helped by men detailed from among the troopers. Both he and the men thus detailed, together with the regular hospital attendants, did work of incalculable service. We had no ambulance with the regiment. On the battlefield, our wounded were generally sent to the rear in mule wagons, or on litters which were improvised. At other times, we would hire the little springless Cuban carts. But, of course, the wounded suffered greatly in such conveyances, and, moreover, often we could not get a wheeled vehicle of any kind to transport even the most serious cases. On the day of the big fight, July 1st, as far as we could find out, there were but two ambulances with the Army in condition to work, neither of which did we ever see. Later, there were, as we were informed, 13 all told, and occasionally, after the surrender, by vigorous representations and requests, we would get one assigned to take some peculiarly bad cases to the hospital. Ordinarily, however, we had to do with one of the makeshifts enumerated above. On several occasions, I visited the big hospitals in the rear. Their condition was frightful, beyond description, from lack of supplies, lack of medicine, lack of doctors, nurses, and attendants, and especially from lack of transportation. The wounded and sick who were sent back suffered so much that, whenever possible, they returned to the front. Finally, my brigade commander, General Wood, ordered with my hearty acquiescence that only in the direst need should any men be sent to the rear, no matter what our hospital accommodations at the front might be. The men themselves preferred to suffer almost anything lying alone in their little shelter tents rather than go back to the hospitals in the rear. I invite attention to the accompanying letter of Captain Llewellyn in relation to the dreadful condition of the wounded on some of the transports taking them north. The greatest trouble we had was with the lack of transportation. Under the order issued by direction of General Miles through the adjutant general on or about May 8th, a regiment serving as infantry in the field was entitled to 25 wagons. We often had one, often none, sometimes two, and never as many as three. We had a regimental pack train, but it was left behind at Tampa. During most of the time, our means of transportation were chiefly the improvised pack trains spoken of above. But as the mules got well, they were taken away from us, and so were the captured Spanish cavalry horses. Whenever we shifted camp, we had to leave most of our things behind, so that the night before each fight was marked by our sleeping without tentage and with very little food, so far as officers were concerned, as everything had to be sacrificed to getting up what ammunition and medical supplies we had. Colonel Wood seized some mules, and in this manner got up the medical supplies before the fight of June 24th, 
when for three days the officers had nothing but what they wore. There was a repetition of this, only in worse form, before and after the fight of July 1st. Of course, much of this was simply a natural incident of war, but a great deal could readily have been avoided if we had had enough transportation, and I was sorry not to let my men be as comfortable as possible and rest as much as possible just before going into a fight when, as on July 1st and July 2nd, they might have to be 48 hours with the minimum quantity of food and sleep. The fever began to make heavy ravages among our men just before the surrender, and from that time on it became a most serious matter to shift camp with sick and ailing soldiers hardly able to walk, not to speak of carrying heavy burdens, when we had no transportation. Not more than half of the men could carry their rolls, and yet these, with the officers' baggage and provisions, the entire hospital and its appurtenances, etc., had to be transported somehow. It was usually about three days after we reached the new camp before the necessaries which had been left behind could be brought up, and during these three days we had to get along as best we could. The entire lack of transportation at first resulted in leaving most of the troop mess kits on the beach, and we were never able to get them. The men cooked in the few utensils they could themselves carry. This rendered it impossible to boil the drinking water. Closely allied to the lack of transportation was the lack of means to land supplies from the transports. In my opinion, the deficiency in transportation was the worst evil with which we had to contend, serious though some of the others were. I have never served before, so have no means of comparing this with previous campaigns. I was often told by officers who had seen service against the Indians that, relatively to the size of the army and the character of the country, we had only a small fraction of the transportation always used in the Indian campaigns. As far as my regiment was concerned, we certainly did not have one-third of the amount absolutely necessary, if it was to be kept in fair condition, and we had to partially make good the deficiency by the most energetic resort to all kinds of makeshifts and expedients. Yours respectfully, Sign, Theodore Roosevelt, Colonel 1st United States Cavalry, forwarded through military channels. Five enclosures, first endorsement, Headquarters 5th Army Corps. Camp Wyckoff, September 18, 1898. Respectfully forwarded to the Adjutant General of the Army. Sign, William R. Shafter, Major General Commanding. End of Appendix B. Section 15 of The Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt. Appendix C. The Round Robin Letter. The following is the report of the Associated Press correspondent of the Round Robin Incident. It is literally true in every detail. I was present when he was handed both letters. He was present while they were being written. Santiago de Cuba, August 3rd. Delayed in transmission. Summoned by Major General Shafter, a meeting was held here this morning at headquarters, and in the presence of every commanding and medical officer of the 5th Army Corps, General Shafter read a cable message from Secretary Alger, ordering him, on the recommendation of Surgeon General Sternberg, to move the Army into the interior to San Louis, where it is healthier. As a result of the conference, General Shafter will insist upon the immediate withdrawal of the Army North. As an explanation of the situation, the following letter from Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, commanding the 1st Cavalry, to General Shafter was handed by the latter to the correspondent of the Associated Press for publication. Major General Shafter, Sir, in a meeting of the general and medical officers called by you at the palace this morning, we were all, as you know, unanimous in our views of what should be done with the Army. To keep us here, in the opinion of every officer commanding a division or a brigade, will simply involve the destruction of thousands. There is no possible reason for not shipping practically the entire command north at once. Yellow fever cases are very few in the cavalry division, where I command one of the two brigades, and not one true case of yellow fever has occurred in this division, except among the men sent to the hospital at Sibonay, where they have, I believe, contracted it. But in this division there have been 1,500 cases of malarial fever. Hardly a man has yet died from it, but the whole command is so weakened and shattered as to be ripe for dying like rotten sheep. When a real yellow fever epidemic, instead of a fake epidemic, like the present one, strikes us, as it is bound to do if we stay here at the height of the sickness season, August and the beginning of September. 
Quarantine against malarial fever is much like quarantining against a toothache. All of us are certain that as soon as the authorities at Washington fully appreciate the condition of the Army, we shall be sent home. If we are kept here, it will in all human possibility mean an appalling disaster, for the surgeons here estimate that over half the Army, if kept here during the sickly season, will die. This is not only terrible from the standpoint of the individual lives lost, but it means ruin from the standpoint of military efficiency of the flower of the American Army for the great bulk of the regulars are here with you. The sick list, large though it is, exceeding 4,000, affords but a faint index of the debilitation of the army. Not 20% are fit for active work. Six weeks on the North Main Coast, for instance, or elsewhere where the yellow fever germ cannot possibly propagate, would make us all as fit as fighting cocks, as able as we are eager to take a leading part in the great campaign against Havana in the fall even if we are not allowed to try Puerto Rico. We can be moved north, if moved at once, with absolute safety to the country, although, of course, it would have been infinitely better if we had been moved north or to Puerto Rico two weeks ago. If there were any object in keeping us here, we would face yellow fever with as much indifference as we face bullets. But there is no object. The four immune regiments ordered here are sufficient to garrison the city and surrounding towns and there is absolutely nothing for us to do here, and there has not been since the city surrendered. It is impossible to move into the interior. Every shifting of camp doubles the sick rate in our present weakened condition, and, anyhow, the interior is rather worse than the coast, as I have found by actual reconnaissance. Our present camps are as healthy as any camps at this end of the island can be. I write only because I cannot see our men who have fought so bravely and who have endured extreme hardship and danger so uncomplainingly go to destruction without striving so far as lies in me to avert a doom as fearful as it is unnecessary and undeserved. Yours respectfully, Theodore Roosevelt, Colonel, Commanding, 2nd Cavalry, Brigade. After Colonel Roosevelt had taken the initiative, all the American general officers united in a round robin addressed to General Shafter. It reads, We, the undersigned officers commanding the various brigades, divisions, etc., of the Army of Occupation in Cuba, are of the unanimous opinion that this army should be at once taken out of the island of Cuba and sent to some point on the northern sea coast of the United States. That can be done without danger to the people of the United States. That yellow fever in the army at present is not epidemic that there are only a few sporadic cases, but that the army is disabled by malarial fever to the extent that its efficiency is destroyed and that it is in a condition to be practically entirely destroyed by an epidemic of yellow fever, which is sure to come in the near future. We know from the reports of competent officers and from personal observations that the army is unable to move into the interior and that there are no facilities for such a move if attempted and that it could not be attempted until too late. Moreover, the best medical authorities of the island say that with our present equipment, we could not live in the interior during the rainy season without losses from malarial fever, which is almost as deadly as yellow fever. This army must be moved at once or perish. As the army can be safely moved now, the persons responsible for preventing such a move will be responsible for the unnecessary loss of many thousands of lives. Our opinions are the result of careful personal observation, and they are also based on the unanimous opinion of our medical officers with the Army, who understand the situation absolutely. J. Ford Kent, Major General, Volunteers Commanding 1st Division, 5th Corps. J. C. Bates, Major General, Volunteers Commanding Provisional Division. Adna R. Shafi, Major General, Commanding 3rd Brigade, 2nd Division. Samuel S. Sumner, Brigadier General, Volunteers Commanding 1st Brigade, Cavalry. Will Ludlow, Brigadier General, Volunteers Commanding 1st Brigade, 2nd Division. Adelbert Ames, Brigadier General, Volunteers Commanding 3rd Brigade, 1st Division. Leonard Wood, Brigadier General, Volunteers Commanding the City of Santiago. Theodore Roosevelt, Colonel Commanding 2nd Cavalry Brigade. Major M. W. Wood, the Chief Surgeon of the 1st Division, said, The Army must be moved north, adding, with emphasis, or it will be unable to move itself. General Ames has sent the following cable message to Washington. Charles H. Allen, Assistant Secretary of the Navy. 
This army is incapable, because of sickness, of marching anywhere except to the transports. If it is ever to return to the United States, it must do so at once. End of Appendix C Section 16 of the Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt Appendix D Corrections It has been suggested to me that when Bucky O'Neill spoke of the vultures tearing our dead, he was thinking of no modern poet but of the words of the prophet Ezekiel. Speak unto every feathered fowl, ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth. At San Juan, the 6th Cavalry was under Major Lebo, a tried and gallant officer. I learned from a letter of Lieutenant McNamee that it was he and not Lieutenant Hartwick by whose orders the troopers of the Ninth cast down the fence to enable me to ride my horse into the lane. But one of the two lieutenants of B Troop was overcome by the heat that day. Lieutenant Rining was with his troop until dark. One night during the siege, when we were digging trenches, a curious stampede occurred, not in my own regiment, which it may be necessary some time to relate. Lieutenants W. E. Ship and W. H. Smith were killed, not far from each other, while gallantly leading their troops on the slope of Kettle Hill. Each left a widow and young children. Captain, now Colonel, A. L. Mills, the Brigade Adjutant General, has written me some comments on my account of the fight on July 1st. It was he himself who first brought me word to advance. I then met Colonel Dorse, who bore the same message, as I was getting the regiment forward. Captain Mills was one of the officers I had sent back to get orders that would permit me to advance. He met General Sunder, who gave him the orders, and he then returned to me. In a letter to me, Colonel Mills says in part, I reached the head of the regiment as you came out of the lane and gave you the orders to enter the action. These were that you were to move, with your right resting along the wire fence of the lane, to the support of the regular cavalry then attacking the hill we were facing. The red roof house yonder is your objective, I said to you. You moved out at once and quickly forged to the front of your regiment. I rode in the rear keeping the soldiers and troops closed and in line as well as the circumstances and conditions permitted. We had covered, I judge, from one-half to two-thirds the distance to Kettle Hill, when Lieutenant Colonel Garlington, from our left flank, called to me that troops were needed in the meadow across the lane. I put one troop, not three, as stated in your account, across the lane and went with it. Advancing with the troop, I began immediately to pick up troopers of the Ninth Cavalry who had drifted from their commands and soon had so many they demanded nearly all my attention. With a line thus made up, the coward troopers on the left and yours on the right, the portion of Kettle Hill on the right of the red-roofed house was first carried. I very shortly thereafter had a strong firing line established on the crest nearest the enemy, from the corner of the fence around the house to the low ground on the right of the hill, which fired into the strong line of conical straw hats whose brims showed just above the edge of the Spanish trench directly west of that part of the hill. These hats made a fine target. I had placed a young officer of your regiment in charge of the portion of the line on top of the hill, and was about to go to the left to keep the connection of the brigade. Captain McBlain, 9th Cavalry, just then came up on the hill from the left and rear. When the shot struck, that put me out of the fight. There were many wholly erroneous accounts of the Guasimas fight published at the time, for the most part written by newspaper men who were in the rear and utterly ignorant of what really occurred. Most of these accounts possess a value so purely ephemeral as to need no notice. Mr. Stephen Bonso, however, in his book, The Fight for Santiago, has cast one of them in a more permanent form, and I shall discuss one or two of his statements. Mr. Bonzo was not present at the fight, and indeed, so far as I know, he never at any time was with the cavalry in action. He puts in his book a map of the supposed skirmish ground, but it bears to the actual scene of the fight only the well-known likeness borne by Mammoth to Macedon. There was a brook on the battleground, and there is a brook in Mr. Bonzel's map. The real brook, flowing down from the mountains, crossed the valley road and ran down between it and the hill trail, going nowhere near the latter. The Bonzel brook flows at right angles to the course of the real brook and crosses both trails, that is, it runs uphill. It is difficult to believe that the Bonzel map could have been made by any man who had gone over the hill trail 
followed by the Rough Riders, and who knew where the fighting had taken place. The position of the Spanish line on the Bonzo map is inverted compared to what it really was. On page 90, Mr. Bonzo says that in making the precipitate advance, there was a rivalry between the regulars and Rough Riders, which resulted in each hurrying recklessly forward to strike the Spaniards first. On the contrary, the official reports show that General Young's column waited for some time after it got to the Spanish position, so as to allow the Rough Riders, who had the more difficult trail, to come up. Colonel Wood kept his column walking at a smart pace, merely so that the regulars might not be left unsupported when the fight began, and, as a matter of fact, it began almost simultaneously on both wings. On page 91, Mr. Bonzo speaks of the foolhardy formation of a solid column along a narrow trail, which brought them, the Rough Riders, within point-blank range of the Spanish rifles and within the unobstructed sweep of their machine guns. He also speaks as if the advance should have been made with the regiment deployed through the jungle. Of course, the only possible way by which the Rough Riders could have been brought into action in time to support the regulars was by advancing in column along the trail at a good smart gait. As soon as our advance guard came into contact with the enemy's outpost, we deployed. No firing began for at least five minutes after Captain Capron sent back word that he had come upon the Spanish outpost. At the particular point where this occurred, there was a dip in the road, which probably rendered it, in Capron's opinion, better to keep part of his men in it. In any event, Captain Capron, who was as skillful as he was gallant, had ample time between discovering the Spanish outpost and the outbreak of the firing to arrange his troop in the formation he deemed best. His troop was not in solid formation. His men were about ten yards apart. Of course, to have walked forward deployed through the jungle, prior to reaching the ground where we were to fight, would have been a course of procedure so foolish as to warrant the summary court-martial of any man directing it. We could not have made half a mile an hour in such a formation and would have been at least four hours too late for the fighting. On page 92, Mr. Bonzo says that Captain Capron's troop was ambushed and that it received the enemy's fire a quarter of an hour before it was expected. This is simply not so. Before the column stopped, we had passed a dead Cuban, killed in the preceding day's skirmish, and General Wood had notified me on information he had received from Capron that we might come into contact with the Spaniards at any moment. And, as I have already said, Captain Capron discovered the Spanish outpost, and we halted and partially deployed the column before the firing began. We were at the time exactly where we had expected to come across the Spaniards. Mr. Bonzo, after speaking of L Troop, adds, The remaining troops of the regiment had traveled more leisurely, and more than half an hour elapsed before they came up to Capron's support. As a matter of fact, all the troops traveled at exactly the same rate of speed, although there were stragglers from each, and when Capron halted and sent back word that he had come upon the Spanish outpost, the entire regiment closed up, halted, and most of the men sat down. We then, some minutes after the first word had been received, and before any firing had begun, received instructions to deploy. I had my right wing partially deployed before the first shots between the outposts took place. Within less than three minutes, I had G Troop with Llewellyn, Greenway, and Leahy, and one platoon of K Troop under Kane on the firing line, and it was not until after we reached the firing line that the heavy volley firing from the Spaniards began. On page 94, Mr. Basel says, A vexatious delay occurred before the two independent columns could communicate and advance with concerted action. When the two columns were brought into communication, it was immediately decided to make a general attack upon the Spanish position. With this purpose in view, the following disposition of the troops was made before the advance of the brigade all along the line was ordered. There was no communication between the two columns prior to the general attack, nor was any order issued for the advance of the brigade all along the line. The attacks were made wholly independently, and the first communication between the columns was when the right wing of the Rough Riders, in the course of their advance, by their firing, dislodged the Spaniards from the hill across the ravine to the right, and then saw the regulars come up that hill. Mr. Bonzo's account of what occurred among the regulars parallels his account of what occurred among the Rough Riders. He states that the squadron of the 10th Cavalry delivered the main attack upon the hill, which was the strongest point of the Spanish position. 
and he says of the troopers of the 10th Cavalry that their better training enabled them to render more valuable service than the other troops engaged. In reality, the 10th Cavalrymen were deployed in support of the 1st, though they mingled with them in the assault proper, and so far as there was any difference at all in the amount of work done, it was in favor of the 1st. The statement that the 10th Cavalry was better trained than the 1st and rendered more valuable service has not the slightest basis whatsoever of any kind, sort, or description, in fact. The 10th Cavalry did well what it was required to do. As an organization, in this fight it was rather less heavily engaged and suffered less loss, actually and relatively, than either the 1st Cavalry or the Rough Riders. It took about the same part that was taken by the left wing of the Rough Riders, which wing was similarly rather less heavily engaged than the right and center of the regiment. Of course, this is a reflection neither on the 10th Cavalry nor on the left wing of the Rough Riders. Each body simply did what it was ordered to do, and did it well. But the claim that the 10th Cavalry did better than the 1st, or bore the most prominent part in the fight, is like making the same claim for the left wing of the Rough Riders. All the troops engaged did well, and all alike are entitled to share in the honor of the day. Mr. Bonzell out Spaniards the Spaniards themselves as regards both their numbers and their loss. These points are discussed elsewhere. He develops for the Spanish side to account for their retreat a wholly new explanation, viz. that they retreated because they saw reinforcements arriving for the Americans. The Spaniards themselves make no such claim. Lieutenant Tejero asserts that they retreated because news had come of a wholly mythical American advance on Morro Castle. The Spanish official report simply says that the Americans were repulsed, which is about as accurate a statement as the other two. All three explanations, those by General Rubin, by Lieutenant Tejero, and by Mr. Bonzell alike, are precisely on a par with the first Spanish official report of the Battle of Manoa Bay, in which Admiral Dewey was described as having been repulsed and forced to retire. There are one or two minor mistakes made by Mr. Bonzell. He states that on the roster of the officers of the Rough Riders, there were ten West Pointers. There were three, one of whom resigned. Only two were in the fighting. He also states that after Las Guasimas, Brigadier General Young was made a Major General, and Colonel Wood a Brigadier General, while the commanding officers of the 1st and 10th Cavalry were ignored in this shower of promotions. In the first place, the commanding officers of the 1st and 10th Cavalry were not in the fight, only one squadron of each having been present. In the next place, there was no shower of promotions at all. Nobody was promoted except General Young, save to fill the vacancies caused by death or by promotion of General Young. Wood was not promoted because of this fight. General Young most deservedly was promoted. Soon after the fight, he fell sick. The command of the brigade then fell upon Wood, simply because he had higher rank than the other two regimental commanders of the brigade and I then took command of the regiment exactly as Lieutenant Colonels Vale and Baldwin had already taken command of the 1st and 10th Cavalry when their superior officers were put in charge of brigades. After the San Juan fighting, in which Wood commanded a brigade, he was made a brigadier general, and I was then promoted to the nominal command of the regiment, which I was already commanding in reality. Mr. Bonzell's claim of superior efficiency for the colored regular regiments, as compared with the white regular regiments, does not merit discussion. He asserts that General Wheeler brought on the Guasimas fight in defiance of orders. Lieutenant Miley, in his book, In Cuba with Shafter, on page 83, shows that General Wheeler made his fight before receiving the order which it is claimed he disobeyed. General Wheeler was in command ashore. He was told to get in touch with the enemy and being a man with the fighting edge, this meant that he was certain to fight. No general who was worth his salt would have failed to fight under such conditions. The only question would be as to how the fight was to be made. War means fighting, and the soldier's cardinal sin is timidity. General Wheeler remained throughout steadfast against any retreat from before Santiago. But the merit of keeping the army before Santiago without withdrawal until the city fell belongs to the authorities at Washington, who, at this all-important stage of the operations, showed to mark the advantage in overruling the proposals made by the highest generals in the field looking towards partial retreat or toward the abandonment of the effort to take the city. The following note, written by Sergeant E. G. Norton of B Troop, refers to the death of his brother, Oliver B. Norton, one of the most gallant and soldierly men in the regiment. 
On July 1st, I, together with Sergeant Campbell and Troopers Bardshar and Dudley Dean and my brother, who was killed, and some others, was at the front of the column right behind you. We moved forward, following you as you rode, to where we came upon the troopers of the Ninth Cavalry and a part of the first lying down. I heard the conversation between you and one of the two of the officers of the Ninth Cavalry. You ordered a charge, and the regular officers answered that they had no orders to move ahead, whereupon you said, Then let us through, and march forward through the lines, our regiment following. The men of the Ninth and First Cavalry then jumped up and came forward with us. Then you waved your hat and gave the command to charge, and we went up the hill. On the top of Kettle Hill, my brother, Oliver B. Norton, was shot through the head and in the right wrist. It was just as you started to lead the charge in San Juan Hills ahead of us, we saw that the regiment did not know you had gone and were not following, and my brother said, For God's sake, follow the colonel. And as he rose, a bullet went through his head. In reference to Mr. Ponsal's account of the Guasimus fight, Mr. Richard Harding Davis writes me as follows. We had already halted several times to give the men a chance to rest, and when we halted for the last time, I thought it was for this same purpose, and began taking photographs of the men of L Troop, who were so near that they asked me to be sure and save them a photograph. Wood had twice disappeared down the trail beyond them in return. As he came back for the second time, I remembered that you walked up to him, we were all dismounted then, and saluted and said, Colonel, Dr. Lamotte reports that the pace is too fast for the men, and that over fifty have fallen out from exhaustion. Wood replied sharply, I have no time to bother with sick men now. You replied, more in answer, I suppose, to his tone than to his words. I merely repeated what the surgeon reported to me. Wood then turned and said an explanation, I have no time for them now. I mean that we are in sight of the enemy. This was the only information we received that the men of the L Troop had been ambushed by the Spaniards, and, if they were, they were very calm about it, and I certainly was taking photographs of them at the time, and the rest of the regiment, instead of being half an hour's march away, was seated comfortably along the trail not twenty feet distant from the men of L Troop. You deployed G Troop under Captain Llewellyn into the jungle at the right, and sent K Troop after it, and Wood ordered Troops E and F into the field on our left, it must have been from 10 to 15 minutes after Capron and Wood had located the Spaniards before either side fired a shot. When the firing did come, I went over to you and joined G Troop and a detachment of K Troop under Woodbury Kane, and we located more of the enemy on a ridge. If it is to be ambushed when you find the enemy exactly where you want to find him, and your scouts see him soon enough to give you sufficient time to spread five troops in skirmish order to attack him, and you then drive him back out of three positions for a mile and a half, then most certainly, as Bonzel says, L Troop of the Rough Riders was ambushed by the Spaniards on the morning of June 24th. General Wood also writes me at length about Mr. Bonzel's book, stating that his account of the Guasimus fight is without foundation in fact. He says, We had five troops completely deployed before the first shot was fired. Captain Capron was not wounded until the fight had been going on fully 35 minutes. The statement that Captain Capron's troop was ambushed is absolutely untrue. We have been informed, as you know, by Castillo's people, that we should find a dead gorilla a few hundred yards on the Sibine side of the Spanish lines. He then alludes to the waving of the guidon by K Troop as the only means of communication with the regulars. He mentions that his orders did not come from General Wheeler and that he had no instructions from General Wheeler directly or indirectly at any time previous to the fight. General Wood does not think that I give quite enough credit to the Rough Riders as compared to the regulars in this Guasimus fight and believes that I greatly underestimate the Spanish force and loss and that Lieutenant Tejero is not to be trusted at all these points. He states that we began the fight ten minutes before the regulars and that the main attack was made and decided by us. This was the view that I and all the rest of us in the regiment took at the time. But, as I have found out since, that the members of the 1st and 10th regular regiments held, with equal sincerity, the view that the main part was taken by their own commands. I have come to the conclusion that the way I have described the action is substantially correct, owing to the fact that the 10th Cavalry, which was originally in support, moved forward until it got mixed with the 1st, it is very difficult to get the exact relative position of the different troops of the 1st and 10th in making the advance. Beck and Galbraith were on the left. Apparently Wainwright was farthest over on the right. 
General Wood states that Leonardo Ross, the civil governor of Santiago, at the time of the surrender, told him that the Spanish force at Guasimas consisted of not less than 2,600 men, and that there were nearly 300 of them killed and wounded. I did not myself see how it was possible for us, as we were the attacking party and were advancing against superior numbers well sheltered, to inflict five times as much damage as we received. But as we buried eleven dead Spaniards, and as they carried off some of their dead, I believe the loss to have been very much heavier than Lieutenant Tejero reports. General Wood believes that in following Lieutenant Tejero, I have greatly underestimated the number of Spanish troops who were defending Santiago on July 1st, and here I think he completely makes out his case. He taken the view that Lieutenant Tejero's statements were made for the purpose of saving Spanish honor. On this point, his letter runs as follows. A word in regard to the number of troops in Santiago, I have had, during my long association here, a good many opportunities to get information which you have not got and probably never will get. That is, information from parties who were actually in the fight, who are now residents of the city. Also information which came to me as commanding officer of the city directly after the surrender. To sum up briefly as follows, the Spanish surrendered in Santiago 12,000 men. We shipped from Santiago something over 14,000 men. The 2,000 additional were troops that came in from St. Louis, Sango, and small upcountry posts. The 12,000 in the city, minus the force of General Scario, 3,300 infantry, and 680 cavalry, or in round numbers, 4,000 men, who entered the city just after the battles of San Juan and El Caney, leaves 8,000 regulars plus the dead plus Chevera's Marines and Blue Jackets, which he himself admits landing in the neighborhood of 1,200, and reports here are that he landed 1,380, and plus the Spanish Volunteer Battalion, which was between 800 and 900 men, this statement I have from the Lieutenant Colonel of this very battalion gives us in round numbers present for duty on the morning of July 1st not less than 10,500 men. These men were distributed 890 at Caney, two companies of artillery at Morro, one at Sacopa, and a half a company at Point de Gorda. In all, not over 500 or 600 men, but for the sake of argument we can say a 1,000. In round numbers, then, we had immediately about the city 8,500 troops. These were scattered from the cemetery around to Aguadores. In front of us, actually in the trenches, there could not by any possible method of figuring have been less than 6,000 men. You can twist it any way you want to. The figures I have given you are absolutely correct. At least they are absolutely on the side of safety. It is difficult for me to withstand a temptation to tell what has befallen some of my men since the regiment disbanded. How McGinty, after spending some weeks in Roosevelt Hospital in New York with an attack of fever, determined to call upon his captain, Woodbury Kane, when he got out, and procuring a horse rode until he found Kane's house, when he hitched the horse to a lamppost and strolled in. How Cherokee Bill married a wife in Hoboken, and as that pleasant city ultimately proved an uncongenial field for his activities, how I had to send both himself and his wife out to the territory. How Happy Jack, haunted by visions of the social methods obtaining in the best saloons of Arizona, applied for the position of bouncer out at the executive chamber when I was elected governor, and how I got him a job at railroading instead, and finally had to ship him back to his own territory also. How a valued friend from a cow ranch in the remote west accepted a pressing invitation to spend a few days at the home of another ex-trooper, a New Yorker of fastidious instincts, and arrived with an umbrella as his only baggage. How poor Holderman and Pollock both died and were buried with military honors, all of Pollock's tribesmen coming to the burial. How Tom Isbell joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And how, on the other hand, George Rowland scornfully refused to remain in the east at all writing to a gallant young New Yorker who had been his bunkie, Well, old boy, I'm glad I didn't go home with you for them people to look at, because I ain't a buffalo or a rhinoceros or a giraffe, and I don't like to be stared at, and you know we didn't do no hard fighting down there. I have been in closer places than that right here in the United States, that is better men to fight than them damn Spaniards. In another letter, Rowland tells of the fate of Tom Darnell, the writer, he who rode the Sorrel horse of the 3rd Cavalry. There ain't much news to write of except poor old Tom Darnell got killed about a month ago. Tom and another fellow had a fight, and he shot Tom through the heart, and Tom was dead when he hit the floor. Tom was sure a good old boy, and I sure hated to hear of him going, and he had plenty of grit, too. No man would ever call on him for a fight that he didn't get it. 
My men were children of the dragon's blood, and if they had no outland foe to fight and no outlet for their vigorous and daring energy, there was always the chance of their fighting one another. But the great majority, if given the chance to do hard or dangerous work, availed themselves of it with the utmost eagerness, and though fever sickened and weakened them so that many died from it during the few months following their return, yet, as a whole, they are now doing fairly well. A few have shot other men or been shot themselves. A few ran for office and got elected, like Llewellyn and Luna in New Mexico, or defeated, like Brody and Wilcox in Arizona. Some have been trying hard to get to the Philippines. Some have returned to college, or to law, or the factory, or the counting room. Most of them have gone back to the mine, the ranch, and the hunting camp, and the great majority have taken up the threads of their lives where they dropped them when the main was blown up and the country called to arms. End of Appendix D End of The Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt Section 17 of The Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt Appendix E Congressional Record, 55th Congress, 3rd Session, Volume 32, Part 2, Page 1250 Nominations by the President To be Colonel by Brevet Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, 1st Volunteer Cavalry, for Gallantry in Battle, La Guasima, Cuba, June 24, 1898 To be Brigadier General by Brevet Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, 1st Volunteer Cavalry, for Gallantry in Battle, Santiago de Cuba, July 1, 1898. Nominated for Brevet Colonel, to rank from June 24, 1898. Fort San Juan, Cuba, July 17, 1898. The Adjutant General, United States Army, Washington, D.C., through military channels. Sir, I have the honor to invite attention to the following list of officers and enlisted men who specially distinguished themselves in the action at Las Guasimas, Cuba, June 24, 1898. These officers and men have been recommended for favorable consideration by their immediate commanding officers in their respective reports, and I would respectfully urge that favorable action be taken. Officers in 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, Colonel Leonard Wood, Lieutenant Colonel Roosevelt. Respectfully, Joseph Wheeler, Major General, United States Volunteers, Commanding. Headquarters, 2nd Cavalry Brigade. Camp near Santiago de Cuba, Cuba, June 29, 1898. The Adjutant General, Cavalry Division. Sir, by direction of the Major General commanding the Cavalry Division, I have the honor to submit the following report of the engagement of a part of this brigade with the enemy at Guasimas, Cuba, on June 24, accompanied by detailed reports from the regimental and other commanders engaged and a list of the killed and wounded. I cannot speak too highly of the efficient manner in which Colonel Wood handled his regiment and of his magnificent behavior on the field. The conduct of Lieutenant Colonel Roosevelt, as reported to me by my two aides, deserves my highest commendation. Both Colonel Wood and Lieutenant Colonel Roosevelt disdained to take advantage of shelter or cover from the enemy's fire while any of their men remain exposed to it, an error of judgment but happily on the heroic side. Very respectfully, S. B. M. Young, Brigadier General, United States Volunteers, Commanding. Headquarters, 1st Division, 2nd Army Corps, Camp McKenzie, Georgia, December 30th, 1898. Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Sir, I have the honor to recommend Honorable Theodore Roosevelt, late Colonel 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, for a Medal of Honor as a reward for conspicuous gallantry at the Battle of San Juan, Cuba, on July 1st, 1898. Colonel Roosevelt, by his example and fearlessness, inspired his men, and both at Kettle Hill and the ridge known as San Juan, he led his command in person. I was an eyewitness of Colonel Roosevelt's action. As Colonel Roosevelt has left the service, a brevet commission is of no particular value in his case. Very respectfully, Samuel S. Sumner, Major General, United States Volunteers. West Point, New York 
December 17, 1898. My dear Colonel, I saw you lead the line up the first hill. You were certainly the first officer to reach the top, and through your efforts and your personally jumping to the front, a line, more or less thin, but strong enough to take it, was led by you to the San Juan or First Hill. In this your life was placed in extreme jeopardy, as you may recall, and as it proved by the number of dead left in that vicinity. Captain Stevens, then of the Ninth Cavalry, now of the Second Cavalry, was with you, and I am sure he recalls your gallant conduct. After the line started on the advance from the First Hill, I did not see you until our line was halted under a most galling fire at the extreme front where you afterwards entrenched. I spoke to you there and gave instructions from General Sumner that the position was to be held and that there would be no further advance till further orders. You were the senior officer there, took charge of the line, scolded me for having my horse so high upon the ridge. At the same time, you were exposing yourself most conspicuously while adjusting the line for the example was necessary, as was proved when several colored soldiers, about eight or ten, 24th Infantry, I think, started at a run to the rear to assist a wounded colored soldier, and you drew your revolver and put a short and effective stop to such apparent stampede. It quieted them. That position was hot, and now I marvel at your escaping there. Very sincerely yours, Robert L. Howes. West Point, New York, December 17, 1898. I hereby certify that on July 1, 1898, Colonel, then Lieutenant Colonel, Theodore Roosevelt, 1st Volunteer Cavalry, distinguished himself through the action and on two occasions during the battle when I was an eyewitness. His conduct was most conspicuous and clearly distinguished above other men as follows. 1. At the base of San Juan, or First Hill, there was a strong wire fence, or entanglement, at which the line hesitated under a galling fire, and where the losses were severe. Colonel Roosevelt jumped through the fence, and by his enthusiasm, his example and courage succeeded in leading to the crest of a hill, a line sufficiently strong to capture it. In this charge, the cavalry brigade suffered its greatest loss, and the colonel's life was placed in extreme jeopardy. Owing to the conspicuous position he took in leading the line, and being the first to reach the crest of that hill, while under heavy fire of the enemy at close range. 2. At the extreme advanced position occupied by our lines, Colonel Roosevelt found himself the senior, and under his instructions from General Sumner to hold that position, he displayed the greatest bravery and placed his life in extreme jeopardy by unavoidable exposure to severe fire while adjusting and strengthening the line placing the men in positions which afforded best protection, etc., etc. His conduct and example steadied the men and on one occasion by severe but unnecessary measures prevented a small detachment from stampeding to the rear. He displayed the most conspicuous gallantry, courage, and coolness in performing extraordinarily hazardous duty. Robert L. Howes, Captain, A.A.G., U.S.V., First Lieutenant, 6th United States Cavalry. To the Adjutant General, United States Army, Washington, D.C. Headquarters, United States Military Academy, West Point, New York, April 5, 1899. Lieutenant Colonel W. H. Carter, Assistant Adjutant General, United States Army, Washington, D.C. Sir, in compliance with the request contained in your letter of April 30th, of the board convened to consider the awarding of brevets, medals of honor, etc., for the Santiago campaign, that I state any facts within my knowledge as adjutant general of the brigade in which Colonel Theodore Roosevelt served, to aid the board in determining, in connection with Colonel Roosevelt's application for a medal of honor, whether his conduct at Santiago was such as to distinguish him above others. I have the honor to submit the following. My duties on July 1, 1898, brought me in constant observation of and contact with Colonel Roosevelt from early morning until shortly before the climax of the assault of the cavalry division on the San Juan Hill, the so-called Kettle Hill. During this time, while under the enemy's artillery fire at El Pozo, and while on the march from El Pozo by the San Juan Ford to the point from which his regiment moved to the assault about two miles, the greater part under fire, 
Colonel Roosevelt was conspicuous above any others I observed in his regiment in the zealous performance of duty, in total disregard of his personal danger and in his eagerness to meet the enemy. At El Pozo, when the enemy opened on that place with artillery fire, a shrapnel bullet grazed and bruised one of Colonel Roosevelt's wrists. The incident did not lessen his hazardous exposure, but he continued so exposed until he had placed his command under cover. In moving to the assault of San Juan Hill, Colonel Roosevelt was most conspicuously brave, gallant, and indifferent to his own safety. He, in the open, led his regiment. No officer could have set a more striking example to his men or displayed greater intrepidity. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, A. L. Mills, Colonel, United States Army, Superintendent. Headquarters, Department of Santiago de Cuba. Santiago de Cuba, December 30th, 1898, to the Adjutant General, United States Army, Washington, D.C. Sir, I have the honor to make the following statement relative to the conduct of Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, late 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, during the assault upon San Juan Hill, July 1st, 1898. I have already recommended this officer for a Medal of Honor, which I understand has been denied him, upon the ground that my previous letter was too indefinite. I base my recommendation upon the fact that Colonel Roosevelt, accompanied only by four or five men, led a very desperate and extremely gallant charge on San Juan Hill, thereby setting a splendid example to the troops and encouraging them to pass over the open country intervening between their position and the trenches of the enemy. In leading this charge, he started off first, as he supposed, with quite a following of men, but soon discovered that he was alone. He then returned and gathered up a few men and led them to the charge, as above stated. The charge in itself was an extremely gallant one, and the example set a most inspiring one to the troops in that part of the line. And while it is perfectly true that everybody finally went up the hill in good style, yet there is no doubt that the magnificent example set by Colonel Roosevelt had a very encouraging effect and had great weight in bringing up the troops behind him. During the assault, Colonel Roosevelt was the first to reach the trenches in his part of the line and kill one of the enemy with his own hand. I earnestly recommend that the medal be conferred upon Colonel Roosevelt, for I believe that he in every way deserves it, and that his services on the day in question were of great value and of a most distinguished character. Very respectfully, Leonard Wood. Major General, United States Volunteers, Commanding, Department of Santiago de Cuba. Huntsville, Alabama, January 4, 1899. The Adjutant General, United States Army, Washington, D.C. Sir, I have the honor to recommend that a Congressional Medal of Honor be given to Theodore Roosevelt, late Colonel, 1st Volunteer Cavalry, for distinguished conduct and conspicuous bravery in command of his regiment in the charge on San Juan Hill, Cuba, July 1, 1898. In compliance with G.O. 135, A.G.O. 1898, I enclose my certificate showing my personal knowledge of Colonel Roosevelt's conduct. Very respectfully, C.J. Stevens, Captain, 2nd Cavalry. I hereby certify that on July 1, 1898, at the Battle of San Juan, Cuba, I witnessed Colonel, then Lieutenant Colonel, Roosevelt, 1st Volunteer Cavalry, United States of America, mounted, leading his regiment in the charge on San Juan. By his gallantry and strong personality, he contributed most materially to the success of the charge of the cavalry division up San Juan Hill. Colonel Roosevelt was among the first to reach the crest of the hill, and his dashing example, his absolute fearlessness and gallant leading, rendered his conduct conspicuous and clearly distinguished above other men. C.J. Stevens, Captain 2nd Cavalry, Late 1st Lieutenant, 9th Cavalry. Young's Island, South Carolina, December 28, 1898. To the Adjutant General, United States Army, Washington, D.C. Sir, Believing that information relating to superior conduct on the part of any of the higher officers who participated in the Spanish-American War, and which information may not have been given, would be appreciated by the department over which you preside, I have the honor to call your attention to the part borne by Colonel Theodore Roosevelt of the late 
1st United States Volunteer Cavalry in the Battle of July 1st last. I do this not only because I think you ought to know, but because his regiment as a whole were very proud of his splendid actions that day, and believe they call for that most coveted distinction of the American officer, the Medal of Honor. Held in support, he brought his regiment at exactly the right time, not only up to the line of regulars, but went through them and headed on horseback the charge on Kettle Hill. This being done on his own initiative, the regulars as well as his own men following. He then headed the charge on the next hill, both regulars and the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry following. He was so near the entrenchments on the second hill that he shot and killed with a revolver one of the enemy before they broke completely. He then led the cavalry on the chain of hills overlooking Santiago, where he remained in charge of all the cavalry that was at the extreme front for the rest of that day and night. His unhesitating gallantry in taking the initiative against entrenchments lined by men armed with rapid-fire guns certainly won him the highest consideration and admiration of all who witnessed his conduct throughout that day. What I hear right I can bear witness to from personally having seen. Very respectfully, M.J. Jenkins, Major, Late First United States Cavalry. Prescott, A.T., December 25, 1898. I was Colonel Roosevelt's orderly at the Battle of San Juan Hill, and from that time on until our return to Montauk Point, I was with him all through the fighting, and believe I was the only man who was always with him, though during part of the time Lieutenants Ferguson and Greenwald were also close to him. He led our regiment forward on horseback until he came to the men of the Ninth Cavalry lying down. He led us through these, and they got up and joined us. He gave the order to charge on Kettle Hill, and led us on horseback up the hill, both Rough Riders and the Ninth Cavalry. He was the first on the hill, I being very nearly alongside of him. Some Spanish riflemen were coming out of the entrenchments, and he killed one with his revolver. He took the men on to the crest of the hill, and bade them begin firing on the blockhouse on the hill to our left, the one the infantry were attacking. When we took it, he gave the order to charge, and led the troops on Kettle Hill forward against the blockhouse on our front. He then had charge of all the cavalry on the hills overlooking Santiago, where we afterwards dug our trenches. He had command that afternoon and night, and for the rest of the time commanded our regiment at this point. Yours very truly, H. P. Barchar. Cambridge, Maryland, March 27, 1902. Theodore Roosevelt, President of the United States, Washington, D.C. Dear Sir, at your request, I send you the following extracts from my diary and from notes taken on the day of the assault on San Juan. I kept in my pocket a small pad on which incidents were noted daily from the landing until the surrender. On the day of the fight, notes were taken just before Grimes fired his first gun, just after the third reply from the enemy, when we were massed in the road about seventy paces from Grimes' guns, and when I was beginning to get scared and to think I would be killed at the halt just before you advance, and under the shelter of the hills in the evening. Each time that notes were taken, the page was put in an envelope addressed to my wife. At the first chance, they were mailed to her, and on my arrival in the United States, the story of the fight taken from these notes was entered in the diary I keep in a book. I make this lengthy explanation that you may see that everything put down was fresh in my memory. I quote from my diary, Quote, the tension on the men was great. Suddenly, a line of men appeared, coming from our right. They were advancing through the long grass, deployed as skirmishers, and were under fire. At their head, or rather in front of them, and leading them, rode Colonel Roosevelt. He was very conspicuous, mounted as he was. The men were the rough riders, so-called. I heard someone calling to them not to fire into us, and seeing Colonel Carroll, reported to him, and was told to go out and meet them and cautioned them as to our position, we being between them and the enemy. I did so, speaking to Colonel Roosevelt. I also told him we were under orders not to advance, and asked him if he had received any orders. He replied that he was going to charge the Spanish trenches. I told this to Colonel Carroll and to Captain Demick, our squadron commander. A few moments after the word passed down that our left, Captain Taylor, was about to charge, Captain McLean called out, we must go in with those troops. We must support Taylor. 
I called this to Captain Demick, and he gave the order to assault. The cheer was taken up and taken up again, on the left, and in the distance it rolled on and on. And so we started. Colonel Roosevelt of the Rough Riders started the whole movement on the left, which was the first advance of the assault. End quote. The following is taken from my notes and was hastily jotted down in the field. Quote, the Rough Riders came in line. Colonel Roosevelt said he would assault. Taylor joined them with his troop. McBlain called to Demick. Let us go. We must go to support them. Demick said all right. And so, with no orders, we went in. End quote. I find many of my notes are illegible from perspiration. My authority for saying Taylor went in with you, joined with his troop, was the word passed to me and repeated to Captain Demick that Taylor was about to charge with you. I could not see his troop. I have not put it in my diary, but in another place I have noted that Colonel Carroll, who was acting as brigade commander, told me to ask you if you had any orders. I have the honor to be, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Henry Anson Barber, Captain, 28th Infantry, formerly of 9th Cavalry. End of Appendix E Section 18 of the Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt Appendix F Headquarters, Pacific Division, San Francisco, California, May 11, 1905 Dear Mr. President, as some discussion has arisen in the public prints regarding the Battle of San Juan, Cuba, July 1, 1898, and your personal movements during that day have been the subject of comment, it may not be amiss in me to state some facts coming under my personal observation as Commanding General of the Cavalry Division, of which your regiment formed a part. It will, perhaps, be advisable to show first how I came to be in command, in order that my statement may have due weight as an authoritative statement of facts. I was placed in command of the Cavalry Division on the afternoon of June 30th by General Shafter. The assignment was made owing to the severe illness of General Wheeler, who was the permanent commander of said division. Brigadier General Young, who commanded the 2nd Cavalry Brigade, of which your regiment, the 1st Volunteer Cavalry, formed a part, was also very ill, and I found it necessary to relieve him from command and place Colonel Wood of the Rough Riders in command of the brigade. This change placed you in command of your regiment. The division moved from its camp on the evening of June 30th and bivouacked at and about El Poso. I saw you personally in the vicinity of El Poso about 8 a.m. July 1st. I saw you again on the road leading from El Poso to the San Juan River. You were at the head of your regiment, which was leading the 2nd Brigade, and immediately behind the rear regiment of the 1st Brigade. My orders were to turn to the right at San Juan River and take up a line along that stream and try and connect with General Lawton, who was to engage the enemy at El Caney. On reaching the river, we came under the fire of the Spanish forces posted on San Juan Ridge and Kettle Hill. The 1st Brigade was faced to the front in line as soon as it had cleared the road, and the 2nd Brigade was ordered to pass in rear of the 1st and face to the front when clear of the 1st Brigade. This movement was very difficult owing to the heavy undergrowth and the regiments became more or less tangled up, but eventually the formation was accomplished and the division stood in an irregular line along the San Juan River, the 2nd Brigade on the right. We were subjected to a heavy fire from the forces on San Juan Ridge and Kettle Hill. Our position was untenable and it became necessary to assault the enemy or fall back. Kettle Hill was immediately in front of the cavalry and it was determined to assault that hill. The 1st Brigade was ordered forward, and the 2nd Brigade was ordered to support the attack. Personally, I accompanied a portion of the 10th Cavalry, 2nd Brigade, and the Rough Riders were to the right. This brought your regiment to the right of the house, which was at the summit of the hill. Shortly after I reached the crest of the hill, you came to me accompanied, I think, by Captain C.J. Stevens of the 9th Cavalry. We were then in a position to see the line of entrenchments along San Juan Ridge and could see Kent's infantry division engage on our left, and Hawkins' assault against Fort San Juan. You asked me for permission to move forward and assault San Juan Ridge. I gave you the order in person to move forward, and I saw you move forward and assault San Juan Ridge with your regiment and portions of the 1st and 10th Cavalry belonging to your brigade. I held a portion of the 2nd Brigade as a reserve on Kettle Hill, not knowing what force the enemy might have in reserve behind the ridge. 
The 1st Brigade also moved forward and assaulted the ridge to the right of Fort San Juan. There was a small lake between Kettle Hill and San Juan Ridge, and in moving forward, your command passed to the right of this lake. This brought you opposite a house on San Juan Ridge, not Fort San Juan proper, but a frame house surrounded by an earthwork. The enemy lost a number of men at this point, whose bodies lay in the trenches. Later in the day, I rode along the line, and, as I recall it, a portion of the 10th Cavalry was immediately about this house, and your regiment occupied an irregular semicircular position along the ridge, and immediately to the right of the house. You had pickets out to your front, and several hundred yards to your front, the Spaniards had a heavy outpost occupying a house with rifle pits surrounding it. Later in the day, and during the following day, the various regiments forming the division were rearranged and brought into tactical formation, the 1st Brigade on the left and immediately to the right of Fort San Juan, and the 2nd Brigade on the right of the 1st. This was the position occupied by the Cavalry Division until the final surrender of the Spanish forces on July 17, 1898. In conclusion, allow me to say that I saw you personally at about 8 a.m. at El Paso, later on the road to San Juan River, later on the summit of Kettle Hill, immediately after its capture by the Cavalry Division. I saw you move forward with your command to assault San Juan Ridge, and I saw you on San Juan Ridge, where we visited your line together, and you explained to me the disposition of your command. I am, sir, with much respect, your obedient servant, Samuel S. Sumner, Major General, United States Army. End of Appendix F Section 19 of the Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt Appendix G From a brief speech made to his men by Colonel Roosevelt after Sunday services on September 4, 1898. I have waited this opportunity of speaking to you before we parted. I feel, and I know you all feel, that we are knit together by ties that can only be severed by death. I care much for the officers... I care even more for the men who make up the rank and file. Our trials, our hardships, our victories, we have all shared together, officers and men. There have been no distinction. We have all worked for the honor of the regiment. The men who were left in Florida did their duty as well as the men who went to Cuba, and all did it without a murmur. What we have done only calls us to renewed exertion in the future. I know you are not likely simply to rest on your laurels. Life is a constant struggle, and no man can afford to remain idle, to rely in the present upon the deeds of an ever-fading past. After the first fight in Cuba, you did not give up and rest on what you had done. On the contrary, you had gotten in touch with the Spaniards once, and each one of you had registered a vow that no one should get ahead of him the next time, and accordingly the next time you did even better. Carry that same sentiment and spirit into your life when you separate for your homes. Every man has felt in the past that the honor of the regiment was in his keeping and that he reflected honor or dishonor on all by his own individual acts. Now, in peace, let each of you have the same feeling for the nation as a whole. Let us so act that at the end of twenty years, those of us who can look back will see that each man has prospered, has become a better man a better American, that we have shown ourselves as capable to fight the battles of peace as of war. The world will be kind to you for about ten days. Until then, everything you do will be considered right. After that, you will be judged by a stricter code, and if you prove worthless, you will be deemed to have been spoiled by the war. For just about ten days, you will be overpraised, overpetted. Then you will find that the hero business is over, for good and all. And if you try to trade any longer on what you have done in Cuba, you will merely excite the laughter of derision. You will do well to remember this, and each turn to his allotted task with all his heart and strength to win success in the only way it can be won, asking no consideration because of the past, but demanding to be judged each on his merits in the actual work of the day. Response of Colonel Roosevelt in accepting an equestrian bronze Camp Wickoff, Montauk Point, New York, September 13, 1898. Officers and men, I really do not know what to say to you. Nothing could possibly happen that would touch and please me as this has touched and pleased me. Trooper Murphy said rightly 
that my men were nearest my heart, for while I know, I need not say to my officers and what a deep regard I hold them, they will not mind my saying that just a little bit closer come the men. I have never tried to coddle you and have never hesitated to call upon you to spend your best blood like water. But, of course, I try to do all I could for you, and you are the best judges as to whether I have succeeded or not. I am proud of this regiment beyond measure. I am proud of it because it is a typical American regiment. The foundation of the regiment was the cowpuncher, and we have him here in bronze. No gift could have been so appropriate as this bronze by Frederick Remington. The men of the West and Southwest, horsemen, riflemen, and herders, have been the backbone of this regiment which demonstrates that Uncle Sam has another reserve of fighting men to call upon, if the necessity arises. The West stands ready to give tens of thousands of men like you, and we are only samples of the fighters the West can put forth. Besides the cowpuncher, this regiment contained men from every section of the country, every state in the Union, and because of that, we feel proud of it. It is primarily an American regiment, and it is American because it is composed of all the races which have made America their country by adoption, and those who have claimed it as their country by inheritance. It gives me extreme pleasure to look around among you and see men of every occupation, men of means, and men who work with their hands for a livelihood, and at the same time know that I have you for friends. You are men of widely different pursuits, yet you stand here side by side. You fought shoulder to shoulder. No man asked quarter for himself, and each one went in to show that he was as good as his neighbor. It shows the American spirit. You cannot imagine how proud I am of your friendship and regard. I have also a profound respect for you because you have fighting qualities and because you had the qualities which enabled us to get you into the fight. Outside of my own immediate family, as I said before, I shall never know as strong ties as with you. I am more than pleased that you feel the same way toward me. I realized when I took charge of you that I was taking upon myself a great responsibility. I cared for you as individuals, but did not forget that at any moment it might be necessary to sacrifice the individual for the whole. You would have scorned a commander who would have hesitated to expose you to any risk. I was bound that no other regiment should get any nearer to the Spanish lines than you got, and I do not think any did. We parted with many in the fight who could ill be spared, and I think that the most vivid memories that we take away with us will be of those whom we left on the Cuban sod and those who died in hospitals here in the United States, the men who died from wounds and the men who, with the same devotion to country, died from disease. I cannot mention all the names now, but those of Capron, O'Neill, and Fish will serve. They were men who died in the pride of their youthful strength. Now... Just a word more I want to say to some of the men I see standing around, not of your number. I refer to the troopers of the regular cavalry regiments, the white troopers and the coward troopers. The latter, the Spaniards called smoked Yankees, but we found them to be an excellent breed of Yankee. I am sure that I speak the sentiments of every man and officer in this assemblage when I say that between you and the other cavalry regiments, there is a tie which we trust will never be broken. I would have been deeply touched if the officers had given me this testimonial, but coming from you, my men, I appreciate it tenfold. It comes to me from you who shared the hardships of the campaign with me, who gave me a piece of your hard tack when I had none, and who shared with me your blankets when I had none to lie upon. To have such a gift come from this peculiarly American regiment touches me more than I can say. This is something I shall hand down to my children and I shall value it more than I do the weapons I carry through the campaign. End of Appendix G End of The Rough Riders by Theodore Roosevelt